Good morning, church. It's good to be here among you, and thank you, Pastor David, for this opportunity to share what uh, I believe God is doing in the ministry of the Carpenter's Hope. And um, some of you may be uh, uh, repeating some of the words of the scripture this morning and say, I can't believe he's here uh, talking about that because this is home and uh, coming back to do this, and it's a privilege uh, to be able to be here today. David, thank you for the opportunity to do this, and also want to thank Gay Fagley for uh, her encouraging me to be here and for you as a church to, to hear what God is doing through uh, the ministry of the Carpenter's Hope. She has been part of our teams for the past year and a half and has sold out to what we are doing. Next slide. Uh, the Carpenter's Hope was established as a faith-based ministry, Texas nonprofit organization in January uh, 2020. And uh, this comes following my retirement from full-time church ministry, where the last three years of that church ministry, I was involved in disaster recovery following Hurricane Harvey here in Texas. Um, and whenever it happened, pastor came to me. I was the uh, administrator there. He came and said, you're from Texas. You've got a construction background. You need to figure out what we as a church need to do to pay Texas back because in the 23, uh, I mean, in the 2013 tornado that came through more, we had a gym in Norman and um, we hosted team after team after team after team from Texas that came to help rebuild Norman and I mean, rebuild more and clean up uh, up there. And he said, it's time for us to pay back. Uh, so we took one trip to Houston, and we took seven trips to the little town of Refurio, just north of Corpus, and there we worked on one church and 23 homes in those seven uh, trips down there restoring. Um, we are dedicated to assisting the underfunded homeowner and churches recover from the damage created by natural disasters. And uh, part of my learning, you know, I'm one of those that never had experienced uh, not being able to recover from something that had happened. Uh, and you see in the news reports all of the many people that go in first response. They go and clean up. They go and feed. They go and take care of people. They go and, and minister to people. The Baptists do it. The Methodists do it. Uh, and other uh, non, uh, non-profits do it. And they do it well. And then the, the president goes, the governor goes, and the senators go. And all those go and they say, we're going to be here till the end. And what I discovered the end some of the times is when they get on the airplane to leave, especially to the underfunded, those that don't have insurance, those that don't have money to repair, those that can't get into their homes. And so their answer to getting back uh, to going again is either to abandon their home, some of them are their only inheritance, uh, or to move back into a home that's either unsafe or unhealthy to live in unless somebody like the Carpenter's Hope comes in and uh, are able to go in and do that, uh, that work for them. Uh, next slide. We received a 501c3 designation as a charitable organization, so we are truly uh, involved in, in what we do and uh, the, the reality of helping those that are there. I'd like to read a passage of scripture that, that one of our team members shared with us on one of our trips that I think speaks a lot of the need for what we do and also I think the challenge of how to do that and how to respond. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 58 verses 9 through 12 and, and I think the message translation probably speaks pretty directly to what we do and, and I think the challenge that we face as well where it says, if you get rid of unfair practices, if you quit blaming vis victims, if you quit gossiping about people's sins, if you're generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight, and I, I will always show you where to go. I will give you a full life in the emptiest places, firm muscles, strong bones. Uh, you'll be well a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew. You'll, be, you'll rebuild foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, and make the community livable again. 
In these past eight years that we've been doing this, both at the church and since we've established the Carpenter's Hope, that's what the Carpenter's Hope and those that have gone with us have become known as, is those that come in to restore communities, to restore homes, to restore individuals' lives after they have lost what they think is everything. Um, and so we are, have been privileged to do that, and we get, uh, you know, we get continuous offers to come back. In fact, when we were in Refurio, our church team always wore green shirts, and the story around Refurio was, when are the green shirts coming back? When are they coming back? And now the, the call is people that we do work for are share it with their friends and neighbors and those that they need help. And my phone rings and says, can you come help? In fact, this week I have about eight homes in the city of Lake Charles, Louisiana, where people have called and said, we need help from Hurricane Laura that happened in August of 2020. And they're still living in homes or out of homes uh, that were damaged during that storm. Next slide. Our methods, uh, we seek funding and we seek volunteers uh, for recovery. And all the work we do for the homeowner is at no expense. Our trips that we go to these are one week long. Uh, we ask volunteers if they can give up a week to go and to do that. If they can't give up a week and have an opportunity to come and, and see what they can do and what we do for a day or two or three days, we are, you are welcome to come and to go do that. It's interesting, and we appreciate those, especially from here, uh, that have come. George Horner is here with us today, and George has been on a number of our trips. Uh, Gay has been working with us for a year and a half. Uh, Stephanie Atkinson uh, is also gone and, and committed to what we do. Uh, from the Utopia area, Bill and Linnell Kellner, have, that you may know, have gone with us. Uh, and so we appreciate those that have, have accepted that call to go and to do. Uh, we recruit skilled and unskilled workers. Uh, don't feel like you have to know how to do anything that we do, because I can tell you more than half of those that have gone on every trip that we go, or at least the first time they go, have no idea what we're going to do. First trip I took with the church in Norman, we took 23 on the trip, and five of us knew what we were going to be doing. and We were going to be insulating and sheetrocking, and the rest said, can you teach us? And I can tell you that, that the team we have, uh, and we are willing to train anybody to do anything that we do, none of it's rocket science, I will tell you it is all hard work. And you get hot and you get tired and you get itchy, but you have a lot of support there and it is a blessing to be able to go and to do God's work in that time. As long as you're willing to work, learn to participate as a team, you are welcome and you are uh, to do that. We don't work to kill you. We expect you to, at the end of the week to go home with all your fingers and toes and arms, but I will pretty much assure you you'll be exhausted and that you will be sore from top to bottom and uh, be glad when the week is over, but you will also be filled because you have done what God has called you to do during that week. Next slide. Our funding, we are glad to say that we have been able to do what we do uh, with individuals and churches that, that sponsor us and, and support us in their funding, and they provide 100% of the funding to date. And uh, we are also glad to say that at this point, no government funding has been involved in what we do. Next slide. <clears throat> we believe that God calls the willing and he will empower the work. The real story of that is that if you look through Scripture, and especially in Romans 12 and other places, uh, but there in Romans 12, Paul writes encouraging words to the church about the gifts that have been given in the church to do the, the ministry of the work of the gospel. And it is a work of the gospel. And that's what we go and do as being the hands and feet of God, of Christ. And these is to present God, God's presence, uh, to pray with those people, to, to minister to those people, to change their life. And the interesting thing about this passage and, and the reality of, of what this is, is that um, all of us are called to do something. But it's always the willing that respond, Right. And it's the willing that respond, and because the willing respond, God blesses that, and he will empower the work of the willing. And so we are, we are pleased for those that have, have said that they are willing to come alongside us 
and to be able to do that. Uh, we invite men, we invite women, we invite youth. Uh, we have just a very small registration fee that goes back to paying uh, things that you will receive during, during your week of work with us. Uh, and we look forward to anyone willing to work and uh, to just learn. Uh, we also always need someone there that can take care of their fellow worker, to take care of those that are there, uh, to take care of the homeowner, and to minister to them as well. So those are always good things. The other thing that we do is, is a belief that uh, this, that for you have been called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not turn from your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For this is the whole law fulfilled in one word in the statement. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's, one of the, that's from Galatians 5, and that's one of our beliefs is that we go to serve one another in love. And uh, that's who we do that. Next slide, the, or this slide. Those that receive assistance, the underfunded homeowners and churches, believe it or not, there are churches that, that especially in storm-prone areas, that aren't able to carry insurance um, and, and certainly don't have funds to recover. And that means no or insufficient insurance um, and no independent, independent financial means to recover. Um, and the reality is, in the last home that we did in, in um, March of this year, it was a two-story home, about 1,800 square feet, had insurance. The home was completely uh, demolished on the inside. Water damage, flood damage, they had to move out. And their first offer for insurance settlement was all of $15,000 to restore a two-story, 1,800 square foot home. So they moved out and three and a half years later, they've been paying rent and mortgage and wondered if they were even gonna be able to save their home or have it foreclosed on them. Next slide. Our work to date, we responded to Hurricane Harvey, Laura, Delta, Ida, and also the Mayfield, Kentucky tornado. Over the last uh, four years, we've uh, provided $275,000 worth of uh, trip expenses, materials, and supplies to go and do the work. We've supplied 24,000 plus volunteer hours, and all that together adds up to over a million dollars of actual uh, financial return to the communities uh, and being able to get people back in their homes. Everybody gets to be a part of the work. I said well ago that we invite women and children, I mean, and youth and, and men to come, and so uh, we'll allow you to do anything that you want to do. Uh, you can hang sheetrock, you can hang insulation, you can, we can learn to use tools if you don't know how to use them. And we will teach you how uh, to do that, but to work together and to do that. How do you move forward after a natural disaster leaves your property looking like this? This is a home down in Refurio that we walked into in April of 2021 that was damaged in Hurricane Harvey. This would have been nearly four years after Hurricane Harvey. This man lived out in the middle of a cotton field and nobody knew he was living in this house. He was catching water in wash tubs. He was 85 year old veteran and when those wash tubs would fill, they were too full for, and too heavy for him to get out of the house so they overflowed and rotted out the floor. Nearly every window in his house had at least one pane blown out. He had one section of wall that was eight feet wide that the storm blew out completely. Most of that because of termite damage, but that was gone. For nearly four years, and this man was still living in this house. And so that was the first house that we did. And next slide, this is what that same living room looks like after a week of work uh, there. We always try to get the sheetrock done and prepare it for the painters. In a week's time, we're not gonna get everything done. And uh, unlike those shows on TV, we can't get it done. We don't work 24 hours a day. We don't hire contractors to come in and do it, but we get it ready for them. And it's better than when we uh, arrived whenever we left. This is a homeowner in Refurio that this was after four years and he was still living in his home looking like this. <clears throat> and this is what it looked like a week after we got there. This is a homeowner in Lake Charles. She was 
the owner of this was a grandmother that had custodian of her 16-year-old granddaughter who was a dysfunctional cerebral palsy patient in a wheelchair. And they had to abandon their home. They had to move out, go to another state to live with grandmother's daughter uh, to be able to survive losing all the services that the, that the granddaughter needed to keep growing and, and improving. And we were able to go into the house and a week later, next slide, <coughs> we went in and we put in, um, we completely uh, set, the, set the house up as handicapped accessible. We put in two new showers. We changed all the doors to three foot doors to be able to, to take care of the granddaughter. And, and needless to say, the grandmother was exci ex excited. This is a church that was in Maryville, Louisiana, a little town uh, right across the state line from, from Jasper, Texas. Um, <laughs> this church, when we arrived and were asked to go look at it, they were ready to burn this church down. This church was 105 years old. And they couldn't figure out how to get it back together and, in fact, had completely given up on it. And when we walked in, the senior deacon's wife there at the church walked out in tears and said, "There is I don't know why these crazy people are here. There's nothing that they can do. Well, about six months later, we went back and we restored, next slide, their sanctuary. We provided them a safe and accessible new entry to their church. Next, and this one in Mayfield, Kentucky. I don't know if you remember the tornado that came through town uh, just before Christmas in 2021, but it destroyed all of town. It destroyed about 90% of the rental homes there, and we were able to go in and work on three homes there to be able to provide new places for people to live. Certainly, women are important to our ministry. On average, about 50% of each team that we take is, is women. In the fall of 2023, we actually took a team of only women to express appreciation for what they do, and they, they uh, participate in all aspects of our ministry. Today, thank you for the privilege of being here to tell you a little bit about who we are. Uh, considering support of the Carpenter's Hope through prayer, financially, or is God being calling you to be part of one of these teams? I know a bunch of you, because I've gotten the reports, have been invited to come and to be a part of these. And we'd just love to be able to do that. Uh, we're going to have uh, one in September and one of our, uh, November of this coming year. And we're going to be uh, promoting those soon. Um, <clears throat> But this is how, where, how you can contact us, but so you can take it with you on a table in the foyer. Uh, we have brochures, we have newsletters of our two last trips and reports on what they did and some pictures of the activities actually involved in those. Um, and we'll also have a tablet out there. If you would like to receive one of those newsletters to keep up on what we were doing, if you just give us our name and your email address, we'd be more than happy to be able to do that. Pastor, thank you, and we appreciate your time, and we appreciate certainly God's uh, direction and call to be able to do this and to be here today. So look forward to visiting with you. George will be out there to answer questions, and my wife Lydia and I will be out there as well. So stop by and say hello. It's good to see you.